Hi there, Emma Drew here and welcome to another episode of Confessions of a YouTuber, the podcast that makes YouTube simple and gets up close and personal with successful YouTube creators, helping you understand what it takes to grow your YouTube channel the easy way. I'd like to thank TubeBuddy for sponsoring today's show. TubeBuddy is a free browser extension that helps you easily manage and optimize your YouTube channel. It's the YouTube channel tool I personally can't live without. For more information, head over to TubeBuddy.com or check out their link in the show notes below. Hi, I'd like to welcome today's guest, Anna Bay from Jet Set Bay. Her YouTube channel has nearly 60,000 subscribers and over 2 million views. She's also a very successful blogger, lifestyle coach and entrepreneur. So let's welcome Anna Bay. Hi Anna, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi, hi. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me. It was great seeing you at VidCon. Yeah, that's where we met, isn't it? How did you find VidCon? Did you enjoy it? I loved VidCon. Yeah. Um, it was my first video conference that I went to and I just left with so much new knowledge and aha moments. And I'm just so happy that I went. I will be going like on all the video kind of events from now on because I just learned so much and it took my uh, my YouTube channel actually like it, it advanced a little bit more after after the event. Well, actually, going back to your YouTube channel, could you describe your YouTube channel to us? You know, what can we expect from Jet Set Babe? Well, actually, my YouTube channel is called School of Affluence. Oh, so Jet Set okay. Babe is my blog and kind of my community for women who enjoy the finer things in life. Mm -hmm. um, but School of Affluence is my online product where I sell an online course with which teaches women elegance. So that's kind of the focus of my YouTube channel. I talk about high society, how to behave there, how to be elegant, feminine, and basically the best version of yourself as a woman. Mm -hmm. So which actually came first? Was it the blogging or the channel? It was the blog. Uh -huh. So How long I, have you been doing that? I, I've been doing it since 2012 because I moved to London in 2012. I got a job offer in an online gambling company doing digital marketing. And oh, when that's I, funny. I used to work for an online gambling company. I'll we'll oh, talk about that after the interview. Yeah, okay, let's do that. <laughs> well, so I was new in London. I didn't know anyone. And uh, I was spending a lot of time on Instagram because it started becoming big. And I was seeing all these glamorous girls posting these fabulous pictures of on Instagram and so I was very bored and I decided to create a blog and repost all these glamorous photos and add some text to it so that's how Jessica made my blog got born and it actually grew pretty quickly because I implemented some SEO on it I you know I had digital marketing experience and a lot of people were finding me and then the blog kind of started spreading by word of mouth so I started building a community around it and yeah I've been doing that for now six years However, my YouTube channel, I only launched it in uh, end of September last year. So it's been kind of going on only for six months. So, so what made you decide if you're doing so well on Instagram, if that's where you started, and then you started your blog, which also, you know, start, you know, continued with that success. Why did you suddenly, after that quite a few years actually decide to go into YouTube well actually to be honest my Instagram wasn't really going well it was growing so incredibly slowly and I could never really hack the way through it and understand why is it not mm -hmm. growing faster mm -hmm. my blog was doing well but because you know blogs are a little bit on the decline mm -hmm. <laughs> as you know um, so less and less people started reading it however you know people were still reading it but then in marketing everybody talks talks about how video is the future and of course I had to try it out plus this is actually kind of funny but about four or five years ago I went to a psychic in London and she told me that you would do really well in front of the camera like if you had a YouTube channel <laughs> and that kind of always stayed with me and I thought to myself I wonder if that psychic was true so I had to kind of start this YouTube channel so she actually put the seed in your mind she did and <laughs> my community because I've, I've been nurturing this community now for for six years so it's been really growing and 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 so on but it was the community who also wanted to have youtube videos and oh. see me on camera so mm -hmm. I, I actually promised them i think that was like a year and a half ago 
And it took me a whole year to start this YouTube channel. And for one whole year, they were asking me, so when is it coming? When is it coming? But it was so difficult to get this YouTube channel off the ground because I was all the time like recording videos, but I was never happy with them. I felt stupid in front of the camera. I had so many hiccups, was not good at presenting and so on. But after one year of practicing, I finally launched my channel. What, at what point did you start to feel more confident then? Did you, was it really just practice, practice, practice? It was just practice because I started to feel confident in, uh, first of all, seeing myself on camera and being comfortable with hearing my own voice mm -hmm. and uh, also seeing like the imperfections of myself on camera. Because as a woman, you know, these things can be difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, I mean, they can be difficult, but sometimes we have to get over ourselves. <laughs> exactly. And it took me a whole year to get over myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all have different rates. Yeah. I'm still not on camera, funnily enough, but uh, <laughs> I managed to hide behind my animations and my podcast. So still oh. practicing. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what was it that sparked the massive growth? I mean, how did you grow so rapidly in just, what, six months? I mean, you know, you started from zero and you've gone to 60,000. I mean, tell us a secret. Yeah, so my average growing rate is 10, 10K per month, which is incredible. Subscribers, had, yeah. Yeah, subscribers. And um, I had, of course, done a bit of research. And the second reason why I wanted to get on YouTube, because everybody in marketing was telling, saying that, um, it's much easier to grow on YouTube than it is like on Instagram or other channels, like as an average. And mm -hmm. I wanted to try that out. And it was true. Somehow mm -hmm. on a daily basis, like I can grow like 300 people whilst on Instagram, I would be lucky if I just grew with like 10 people or 30 mm. people. But how well, many followers do you have on Instagram? So I have 35,000 there and my Instagram just really started growing after my YouTube channel started growing. Oh, so they were really sort of, there was some cross, cross pollination there, wasn't there? Okay. Yes. I mean, I'm, interesting. I'm not perhaps the, the best at Instagram, but YouTube has definitely been my platform because mm -hmm. I noticed that there is actually a lot of space on YouTube, depending what niche you're looking at. My niche is, um, to be honest, Mm -hmm. I'm quite alone in my niche. There isn't mm -hmm. really anyone who's doing what I'm doing. So I think that really helped my growth because it caught interest with my target audience. Yeah. And when they saw that, oh, this channel exists, of course I have to subscribe. So yeah. I don't really know exactly why I grew so fast. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, when I look at my analytics, it's definitely been because YouTube has been suggesting me to people mm -hmm. who are not subscribing to me. And that has literally been mm -hmm. where, where I get all my new subscribers from. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why, why YouTube wants to prioritize like my channel all over some other channel, why they've been promoting me yeah. heavily. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. So um, did you bring over many people from your current audience that you built from your blog and from Instagram? Did you find that they were coming onto your YouTube channel at Absol the beginning? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. every video that I make, I always promote it everywhere I can. Even sometimes I even push it out to my email list. I do Facebook. I have a big Facebook group of 10,000 um, 10, people. And then, uh, yeah, Instagram, stories, feed. Yeah. Yeah, so of course that helps. Yeah. Mm, okay, so, I mean, are you actually um, discussing the YouTube channel within your blog as well? Where, um, yes. Do you, do you so, put in your videos or embed them into your blog? Not every video. Perhaps I should, but I mm -hmm. definitely... That would be an interesting technique to really start raising awareness and getting people to subscribe that are already part of your community of YouTube. So that's... Like. yeah that's a good tip mm, mm. i'm only worried that my blog will then be just kind of my youtube post it won't be so much the posts that are more for the blog so. well i think you know as we move on i mean we have to accept that the whole ecosystem the social media ecosystem is is it's all one you know it's you know it's a holistic practice for us as marketers and as we're just trying to reach as many of our target market as possible yeah so in some ways it's, I think if people are afraid of cannibalization of, oh no, well, or, or not satisfying one group, or actually it all fits in together. Yeah, you're right. You know, so in some ways you're, you're, you're giving even more value by saying, well, you know, here's my blog, blah, blah, blah. And if you want to he hear more about 
this aspect of the blog, check out the video below and then embed the video. I mean, that's why it's all there. It's all there. The tools are there for us. We just have to use it in the right way. Well, mm. what, I, what I like to use my blog and the YouTube video is that the people who perhaps want to have the summary in some form of text or some notes, then they can actually go to my blog and um, not every video will be kind of summarized in a blog post there, but at least they, that gives them some added value that they can get that if they want to. So I think that's a, that's a good tip to, mm -hmm. to do. And likewise on the YouTube, you can, you channel them to your blog and, and your website and that kind of thing in the description and in using the iCards. So that's, that's another good way of cross platform marketing, uh, where you need both really. True. But, you know, after VidCon, when I saw so many great speakers, everybody keeps saying that you have to just try and, and keep your audience as much as possible mm -hmm. on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So that's something I've been testing with recently, just trying not to take them off my channel too much, I only think, when it's really necessary, yeah. basically. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. And, and, and basically, because YouTube want, you know, watch time is one of the key performance indicators. So it's the thing that allows the algorithm to then suggest you more and more. So obviously, if you're not, if you're taking people off your channel and sending them left, right and center, then the algorithm thinks that, OK, well, you know, People are just kind of jumping off YouTube. That's no good for you, not, not good for your session time. So, uh, so that is true. But at the same time, in your description, I don't think there's a huge amount of people that read the description. It's only when they really, really love you and that you really build that engagement and they want to know everything about you. So that's where, you know, I think where you can send people. And that's, that's normal, it really, is just to have your links in there um, and to tell them what they can get more than just from the YouTube channel, what they're going to get more from the blog or, or the website or other places. So, I mean, that's just, you know, it's just trial and error. Yeah. It is a very good point. So, and actually, can anyone become a Jet Set Babe? What do I need to do to become a Jet Set Babe? Well, everybody who wants to become a Jet Set Babe can, of course, because I do believe that everything in life is possible. And the course that I'm selling is a transformative course. So it teaches a woman how she can kind of go from zero to become this woman, to become more elegant, affluent, whatever her goals are. So, yeah, it targets a specific niche of women. So this is not like I'm not, I'm not trying to push this out to everyone out there. Um, hmm. yeah. It's more for the audience who is already interested in the more luxury lifestyle. Type so of the thing. lady who likes the finer things in life, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> yes. I could see myself as that, actually. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I, I might need to grab one of, your, one of your courses and see how well I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will do good. So actually, do you get much engagement on your YouTube channel? Do you check the comments? Do you get people feeding into you? Do, how do you use the comments? Yes, I do get mm -hmm. good engagement. Mm -hmm. We have always a great discussion in the uh, in the comments. We have uh, women who are perhaps already experienced Jessica Babes who like to kind of leave their two cents and kind of get ah. their voice heard, which is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I've really created is actually like a community. And I think that is the big engine behind kind of the success of my brand so far. Because mm -hmm. I really think that if I didn't have this community, I would not have any like very low engagement. And the things would just not, you know, be doing as well as they are. Mm. But don't, don't you get quite a lot of interest from traditional media? Do yes. <laughs> so I've had... Uh, I've been featured quite a lot in media in the yeah. last three, four months or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hasn't really showed too much spike in kind of my subscribers rate. Um, definitely some videos have gone viral thanks to, for instance, like Daily Mail was uh, uh, pu published one of my videos or kind of reposted it. Wow. Um, so you saw an, a direct effect on your YouTube channel, did you, for, for that video? Yeah, right. but, then, but then, of course, you get a lot of people who are not your target audience. Right. So you get a lot of bullies then, yeah. and, you know, there's a lot of negativity, negativity that comes from there as a result. Okay, so... It's a good, good and bad, mm, mm. <laughs> but, I, but I guess the PR has been really helpful for me, like the, the publicity and media, more to kind of give me credibility and authority mm -hmm. as a leader in my niche, mm -hmm. rather than massive growth in sales or subscribers and such. Mm. Actually, I have to ask you because I'm just thinking about traditional media because there was so, so much hype around, do you remember the FIRE Festival? 
yes. uh, fiasco. I mean, actually, you know, it's it's something I don't know a lot of detail about, although I did watch the Netflix documentary. How do you feel about that? Did people talk to you about why this may have happened or...? Not, not so much. I guess what I do, it already sparks a lot of controversy. Uh-huh. So the reason why I keep getting it featured a lot in media is because in some, in, in some perspectives, my topic is controversial as I'm talking about changing class and so on and kind of level up in society. And um, also I talk a lot about like the rich people and society and rich men and so on. And everything around money <laughs> always sparks uh, emotions in people and crazy debates. So, yeah. you know, with regards to fire, I haven't really had too much, too much about that. So actually going back to your videos, how do you create? Do you create them yourself? Uh, do you do all the editing and filming yourself or do you have people to help you? Well, I film all my videos myself and um, before... <laughs> I used to do the beginner mistake of uh, like, okay, today's a new week and I have to publish a video this week. Let me film it right now and uh, edit it now and upload it this evening type of thing. Yeah. No, no planning whatsoever, disaster. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been difficult staying consistent that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, when people told me about, okay, you have to bulk film everything, you do it in bulks. So I started implementing that. And at the moment, my filming schedule is that I bulk film uh, twice per month. Oh, very good. Yeah. So my, I'm trying to publish about two uh, or three videos per week. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Each time, perhaps I record six videos. Mm-hmm. But my strategy is to, uh, before I used to film videos that are 20 minutes, 25 minutes, mm-hmm. <laughs> half an hour, and it was too much. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed... Uh, more success actually when I do shorter videos so I try to keep my videos now 10 10 minutes each sometimes even less maybe five minutes and it's going really well so it makes me very consistent now with my filming days because actually it becomes manageable so that is the filming and when it comes to the editing sometimes I edit my videos but more and more I've been outsourcing it so I have a video editor who just edits everything and I've taught that person how to edit so that I like it and and so on but of course I always have the final say on each each video Mm -hmm. and then the thumbnails I do them myself and that's something I actually Mm -hmm. do not want to outsource for now Mm -hmm. because I'm in the testing phase of my thumbnails. I want to see, uh, with the help of analytics, how they're performing. After mm-hmm. VidCon, actually, I learned so many great things about thumbnails. Mm-hmm. And um, I started implementing certain things. And I must say, my CTR really has improved since. Because yeah. before, my CTR would maybe be, I don't know, 4% or 3%. Now, it can be sometimes 8%, which for me is great. That's fantastic, actually. The CTR is the click-through rate for anyone who's not familiar with that. Yeah, that is a very, very good click-through rate, actually. And it's especially if you've seen it improve through the improvements you've made. I mean, it's not on every video, mm-hmm. eight, but five, six, you know, it's it's definitely more towards this level now than before, like 3%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So what sort of opportunities do you see on YouTube for your niche, for you being on YouTube for the foreseeable future, that is? For me, YouTube yeah. is my main platform right now because oh. of the fast growth, mm-hmm. because to be quite fair, uh, most of my students come from YouTube, so that's where people find me. That's how I find mm-hmm. new people. And to be honest, it's been great for my sales, for my revenue and everything. And I uh, I, um, I, just hit 60K followers or subscribers yeah. today. And, uh, wow, congratulations. I, thank you. That is something to celebrate. Yeah, I'm really excited because right. at VidCon I had just hit 50,000. So oh, hey. yeah, so it's <laughs> going, going good. But my, my, my focus is, of course, to hit 100K maybe uh-huh. before summer. So I'm really going to work hard on that. Okay. But with, with regards to just opportunities, it's, yeah, reach more people, grow, make more mm. sales. And mm-hmm. I feel like it's going well. It's going that direction right now. Mm-hmm. Have you ever done uh, Facebook ads? No. And it's no. something that I need to start with. Uh-huh. Do you think you need to do Facebook ads if you're doing your videos? I have no idea. <laughs> mm, yeah. Okay. What do you think? Well, uh, I'll take that one offline too. All right. but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I was interested because because um, you've seen so much uh, success and so much rapid growth that I, I think it's really exciting that you know that you put your effort in that because I think sometimes we can um, 
you know, spread ourselves too thin if we're trying to work on advertising and even doing YouTube ads. I mean, I always, when I speak to my clients, will say, Let, well, let's not start with YouTube ads. Let's start with optimizing your channel first. Then we move on to the advertising. Because when you're advertising, you want to advertise something that has great value. But until you've optimized your channel, you, you're not there yet. So and that's, that's kind of my philosophy of it. Yeah. Anyway, and that's what I say to people. And well, that goes for both Facebook ads and um, for uh, YouTube. But going back to the Facebook ads or any other advertising or Google ads, you know, it's one thing to advertise a course or something like that that you're selling or a product. But when it's on YouTube and there's you're offering so much value and it's free and nobody is committed or anything at that point, when you offer so much value, they then engage with you. So the your relationship becomes much deeper than them coming to you through an advert uh, for something so I think that it has it has so much power in that respect and uh, and you know and I do believe that that's where your where you find your absolutely loyal subscriber who then becomes a customer and then who becomes your advocate who then talks to other people about oh they should you should see this check out this channel or this person you know so I think it has sort of a, a much wider depth of uh, sustainability for your business in some ways you know than an ad that comes and goes you know yeah you're right so like if you're looking for something that's giving you uh, a quick fix and you want to promote uh say a promotion that you've got I think it's fine to have an advert and I think it's fine to advertise your channel even I've seen people do that and I remember doing that a little while ago uh but I think your channel has to be in a really good place Mm -hmm. before so tell me a little bit about um what your audience is like I mean who are they typically well my Audience is, of course, a woman, <laughs> even mm. though a few men drop in sometimes and <laughs> leave a few hate notes. <laughs> yeah, because, mm. you know. <laughs> um, but I would say anyone really from the age of 20 to 35 is my main, main audience. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, you always have somebody who is younger and, of course, you have older. Like, I have even a few course students that are 55 years old or 60 mm-hmm. so you mm-hmm. can sometimes get a little bit of everything so is it a bit of a mindset then really that you're you're talking to people who obviously share a certain uh, attitude or a, a world view on how they want to be or exactly and yeah. the women who are you know they want to be better they want to maybe have some form of refinement in them they want mm-hmm. to maybe be on a little different level than when they, where than mm-hmm. where they are right now and are they sort of independent women are they or are they looking for a man who's got loads of money is that you know how does that work into it <sighs> I think it's a mix. My channel or my brand is not specifically about like having a rich man necessarily. Mm. It's more about just being elegant, just having kind of this more affluent lifestyle for yourself, whether you make your own money Mm -hmm. or you have some form of support through a man Mm -hmm. that is kind of your own business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, because I can imagine where you might get the flack from. Because oh yes <laughs> you know, a lot of people wouldn't well obviously your community are fine but I mean obviously people the outsiders they're going to be looking in going mm, so what happened to feminism and you know independent women but these are independent women who just like the finer things in life and like a bit of luxury I mean who doesn't like a bit of luxury exactly I don't, I don't know anyone <laughs> and maybe that's my jet set babes who I have as friends I don't know but okay yes there is a high society I mean what is I think you know you can make high society yourself really you know it's it's really a, a, a mindset yeah I mean high society it's very hard to define today because money is mm. so accessible meaning that anyone can kind of be high society just with with the the right amount of money these days it's not like it used to be in the past absolutely I mean this you know we're not talking about Downton Abbey here are we (laughs) no (laughs) you know know, today anybody can be anything and we have so much access to everything and you know it's it's kind of a wonderful time actually to be alive and and to and enjoy so much freedom in some ways and uh, what do you what do you actually say to those those guys or the haters on your comments page do you delete them or do you just reply or do you just ignore them and leave the comments there I in the beginning I was reading all the hate and Mm. it was just unnecessary negative energy so I have a VA who actually (laughs) reads all the comments before I read them so she weeds out the really really bad ones I do like to keep some bad comments though mm-hmm. on in my comment section because 
it helps with the kind of discussion and going and uh, it's good to have a little bit of both actually in common. Mm. I think that's a really good point uh, where there's a little bit of controversy. It creates a little bit of engagement. Obviously you're there to moderate. Uh, so nothing goes out of hand, but it doesn't, it, it does create a debate, something like we were just talking about, you know, there will be people within your community who will, you know, fight back or, or, or put people in their place. Yes. And uh, you know, some people, they, like to be there in the comment section they're just in there for the tea and if there is some drama going on then it it makes people engage even if it's not positive things always but it is what it is so yeah and it's a good thing in some ways like I say you know this helps you show up in the suggested videos which is uh, (laughs) you know again because you know the algorithm is saying hey these guys are really engaged here you know um it was quite funny that we have um uh, a nursery rhyme which is the old traditional nursery rhyme called Baba Black Sheep and it had so much so many <laughs> comments like you know especially at the beginning there was so much controversy around it and yeah. originally I was deleting some of those comments and then I started to think no actually this is really good because then people can discuss it between themselves and that's what the community is there for. Yeah, you're right. But you know, actually today I was thinking about one thing is that I think YouTube should start doing something about kind of the negative space that exists on YouTube. For instance, why is there a dislike button? Why Mm. can people post anonymous comments? I think YouTube should be doing something about these things because the climate on YouTube is really not nice. And it's, I think of all the social media channels, YouTube is by far the worst. And this is not good for our general uh-huh. mental health, and especially since yeah. there are so many young you mean people. YouTube mm-hmm. is the worst in in that uh, in monitoring. Well, I mean that because people can be anonymous on YouTube more than, for instance, on Instagram or Facebook. It opens up the opportunity to be more hateful and be mean to people Mm -hmm. rather than how it is on the other channels. And I just think that YouTube should start thinking about how they can create a more positive environment on their platform because it's really, it's not great at the moment. If you think about it, every YouTube creator suffers from this issue and some even from mental health issues as a result from all the hate. You're absolutely right. And there is an issue around being anonymous and being able to comment. And it is so frustrating. And I think, again, we're in, you know, everything is going to have to evolve, you know, and I'm sure there will be at some point some way that they can police this kind of thing. But it's obviously as children are more and more children are watching YouTube and becoming creators, it's becoming more and more priority, yeah. And, and you're right, they do need to look into it. And But in the in the meantime, it's kind of handed over to us in some ways. We can push those people out and keep an eye on, on that kind of thing. So in, in some ways, we take a little bit of responsibility, especially for our own channels. And I think generally speaking, it was a lot worse at the beginning. Ten years ago when I started, it was, you know, this was a kid's channel. <laughs> I had a kid's channel and there were so many haters. Uh, and things I've seen things improve rapidly, but uh, I think there's still a way to go. You're... I mean, the dislike button, I don't understand. Why is it even there? I don't think it improves the quality of the user. I think it just worsens the um, the creator, you know, the creator mm. space. Well, I guess YouTube are probably asking that question. Uh, I'm going to take that question very seriously after their YouTube Rewind video received the most disliked video ever last year at Christmas. I don't know if you remember that. So, no. yeah, they created their usual end of year Rewind, which they kind of, you know, promote what happened that year and it's always a really sort of well anticipated video and unfortunately for them it became the most disliked video ever and I don't know how many dislikes it had but I can oh gosh yeah it's in the millions in terms of their dislikes. how come we got so many dislikes do you know um why? I I just think that perhaps the way in which the content was presented, it, to be fair, I think it was a little bit more global orientated. So they got people from all over the world and creators that maybe other, maybe people in the US or UK or Europe weren't familiar with. And then those people in the other parts of the world, like, I don't know, uh, Asia and and um, I don't know, those, those sorts of places may not have been familiar with some of the creators in the rewind as well so i think there's lots of debates as to why it didn't do so well and why it became the most disliked video for the year 
And I think also they didn't put in a few th- significant things that had happened in that year. And I think that's why. Difficult to say. And it's 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 just unfortunate. I think, to be honest, I also think there was a little bit of momentum involved because as soon as the media picked up that it was getting so much dis so many dislikes i think you know what happens with people they just go on they follow it and then they go and dislike it so i just think it actually just was perpetuated the problem and 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 they get the award for the most um dislike video so so there you go it's funny isn't it yeah so i'm sure they'll be looking into that button i think uh historically it's always been there because it has been an engagement feature yeah. Well, I, I saw recently that uh, now you can also see percentages. So the percentage rate between the likes yeah, and dislikes right. yeah. come up automatically next mm-hmm. to the video. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if they will actually <laughs> remove the dislike button anytime soon, if they yeah. enhance this feature now. I have to say it was one of the first questions I asked them when I had my first account manager a few years ago. I was like, why do you have to have that? It's really, and oh no, it doesn't make any difference. It's just good engagement. That's what they said. And um still what they say so okay okay so we're coming to a close now uh, and i just want to ask you before we head off what's next for for jet set babe as a brand because it's an amazing brand and also on youtube well on youtube the next is to keep on testing with my thumbnails and digging into my analytics because i'm very hot on doing all of this right now because after vidcon it just sparked up this whole new world for me so i'm focusing a lot on testing just to see what works and kind of you know my channel is still very new so i still need to find kind of my voice my space my branding on youtube and so on and Mm -hmm. that's kind of what i'm experimenting with right now Mm -hmm. and what's your ultimate objective then i mean even if you got the growth on the subscriber front or the views front what's your overall objective of the youtube channel i i really want to hit like one million subscribers Mm -hmm. (laughs) i don't know if that will be possible in my Mm -hmm. niche i don't know how Mm -hmm. big my niche is i guess and then but 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 from that even whether you had a million or whether you had five hundred thousand subscribers what do you want to gain from your channel what do you want it to do for you how do you want it to work for your business definitely establish myself as a leader in this niche Mm -hmm. and also to drive sales because that's where I get my revenue from and I don't really work so much with brands as an influencer I focus mainly on selling my own online product and YouTube has been amazing for that so as kind of the next step for my overall business Mm -hmm. is to just you know keep on working on expansion and growth I'm actually hiring now um to work with a growth strategist so someone who actually has experience who has worked at google and you know know youtube very well mm-hmm. so that's going to be a very exciting collaboration to really take my business from just being a solopreneur mm-hmm. to the next level where i treat it as a real business and really strategize mm-hmm. about how for the next coming year two or five and just yeah grow 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 <laughs> fantastic that's brilliant i think you're going to do amazingly well Thank especially you. because you've put you're putting so much thought behind the strategy and the tools that you can use to help you grow and it's not just about the content uh, although you know obviously you know the content but it's all this background stuff that often people don't talk about that i think you've got that all in place which is going to be amazing i can't wait to see you grow and thrive on youtube and i want to be there because i want to be interviewing you this time next year or even sooner Thank when you. you get to that million the subscriber level if you want to see anna's channel then just head over to the podcast show notes and i'll put all the relevant links in there and you can also see her amazing transformational course in case you're interested in that school of affluence so thanks so much for joining us today Thank anna, you. it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and i wish you all the very best with your channel and your business thank you so much Um, and if you're looking to rapidly grow your channel but don't know where to start then join my youtube audience growth lab where i take you through the five steps to automate your youtube success so that you can focus on what you love doing most delivering awesome content and reaching those viewers the great part is it's available all year round and i'm offering the first module absolutely free when you sign up today it's ready and waiting when you are so now's the time to take action you can learn more and see what other students are saying by clicking the link in the show notes below thanks for joining me and i'll see you next time